and unfortunately I'll move it here. So actually we'll have two sessions um, to take for yourselves um, just for an update. So obviously we'll look at yourself. Thank yeah, you thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eyal Eyal Rabin. I'm from the Open University of Israel. I'm a Gaussian alumni. Um, and I will read from the text because English is my second language. Um, and I follow and I speak slower because we have more time now. And it's highly connected to your talk, so it's uh, very glad for the one that has been the, the previous one. So it's kind of an introduction to what I'm going to speak about. So the year 2022 uh, concludes a decade of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. And uh, given the great popularity of these courses, attracting more than 220 million uh, users in home, is it too loud? It's just for me. All right. And more than 900,000 uh, courses around the globe. I would like to ask in this uh, short presentation how the spread of MOOCs affected the relationship between higher education system and the open education resource providers. I will try to deal with this question by using the analytical tool uh, for understanding the impact of digital innovation on the business models of organization in the higher education sector, and by critically examining the common, two common narratives of replacement and disruption that was highly popular when MOOCs were introduced. The examination of the model will be done, I will put it off because for me it's too noisy, yeah? I don't know why. Yeah. I'm used to speak with the uh, um, what I'm going to do is try to examine the, uh, the model by uh, the case study of uh, the uh, Campus AL. Campus AL is the Israeli National uh, Initiative for Digital Learning. So I'm trying to look at what happened in this Campus AL uh, through the last 10 years and to check the changes that have been uh, done by business models of universities compared to OERs. Yeah, in 2022, the thought yeah. In uh, 2022, uh, I published with my two PhD supervisors, Professor Yoram Kalman and uh, Professor Marco Kart, a paper that we work on since around 2018. And we published that in Open Learning, the Journal of Open Distance and e learning, that we named the Cathedral Ivory, and that's why I think it's connected to what we have spoken before, the Cathedral Ivory Tower at the Open Educational Bazaar. Catalyzing innovation in the higher education sector. At that time, the emergence of MOOCs uh, movement and its evolution was accompanied by many speculation that look at MOOCs. Sorry. That look at MOOCs as digital uh, disruptive innovation. The disruptive innovation is a product or a service that takes over the market by disrupting the market's traditional business model. It's like uh, Netflix disrupt the blockbuster model, right? So we are looking at MOOCs it's the same way as what maybe Netflix does to the blockbuster and ask if it has the same effect on the uh, higher education institution. It was speculated at that, that, that time that MOOCs and the open learning, learning materials in general will disrupt the business model of traditional university. Um, it's important to know that almost every race of new technology is accompanied by the prediction about the disappearance of previous technology. That's what happened when uh, television was introduced, so there were predictions that, about the death of the cinema. When the internet was uh, uh, introduced, there were uh, predictions about the death of the television. And those previous speculations were about, first of all, the replacement narrative, the idea that MOOCs will, as a free service, to promote open use of open educational resources, will transform the educational system and replace most of the higher education institutions, that's the idea of the replacement narrative. And the replacement narrative was based on the second speculation about zero marginal uh, um, cost of digital educational products, and the idea that uh, education will be for free. The third speculation was that MOOCs <clears throat> will derive the unbundling of the higher education system into separate entities, each performing only some of the rules that performed by higher education uh, institutions, 
such as research, uh, teaching, and uh, accreditation. The three speculations were based on the assumption that MOOCs movement will enter the basic business model of higher education system. So just uh, just a few words, what is the business model? Because maybe not all, the, all of you are familiar with people, the way that we are using the idea of business model. So business models are an analytical tool that describe the essential of organization using a small number of components, which allows one to summarize uh, the whole activity of the organization by descri describing the components that exist in it and enable convergence between organizations in the same sector and between organizations in different sectors. For example, if you are looking at the higher education system, there are many business models that are suggested, and we can compare between campus-based universities and distant, distant, distant teaching uh, universities. In the original paper that we published at the 2020 and, and mentioned before, we compared the business model of the higher education system <coughs> the higher education sector to the software sector using the metaphor of the cathedral of Mozart that proposed by Raymond in 1999, right? So if you're not familiar with that, go and read uh, this uh, book. It's a great book, short article as well, you can find it online. Eric Raymond, what he had done in his book, suggested the metaphor that contrasts traditional commercial software, the, uh, the, the, the cathedral, with open source, uh, open source software development, the bazaar. We borrowed this metaphor and analogized this relationship with the relationship between cathedral type business model of traditional higher education, meaning the universities, and bazaar type business uh, models in open education, like open educational uh, resource publishers. Um, how can this uh, metaphor of the cathedral and the bazaar can help us to analyze the business model of the higher education system? For the sake of the abstraction and uh, due to the limitation of time, uh, I will look only at the customer value proposition, the CVP, and we look at research universities as an archetype of the cathedral, and as opposed, I will look at MOOCs as an archetype of the bazaar. In traditional universities, that operate as cathedrals, the students get structured, predefined curricula, and study in clearly defined degree awarding programs. On the other hand, in MOOCs that operate as bazaar, the learners have extensive freedom in choosing the learning materials based on their preference goals and uh, needs. Using this uh, analytical tool of business models, we go to the conclusion about the mutual dependence between, between the organization. The bazaar-like organization depends on the cathedral uh, for the creation and production of learning resources. And at the same time, bazaar-like organization has a central role in the ecosystem of higher education sector. So there is mutual dependency. I will skip that and then move into, into the current research. So, to check the validation of this model, check the validation of the prediction that MOOCs will not replace the universities, but rather there will be a mutual uh, interaction between the two uh, uh, constructs. I uh, studied the, I studied now the Israeli case study and I investigated the rule of campus IN. The National Initiative for Digital Learning and the biggest MOOC provider in Israel. Campus AI was established seven years ago as an ecosystem and open options uh, for conducting online courses with the task to push the Israeli government forward to become a digital government, accelerate financial growth, and close social and digital gaps. Uh, by using books and other forms of online learning, Campus AI allow wide audience. To develop, develop and advance the lifelong uh, learning skills. It's over. It's over over uh, 400 open and free digital courses in Hebrew, Arabic, and English, and serve over 700,000 registered learners. Um, in this analysis, I look specifically at the academic segment, although there are other segments uh, website, 
Uh, the study aims to explore the relationship between the Israeli universities, the cathedrals, which provide the knowledge of the experts to create the books, and campus AN, the bazaar, uh, that produce and distribute the, the courses. Those enabling the spread of knowledge that was locked in the ivory tower before the emergence of books. Um, the current research is a work in progress. I started it a few months ago. Um, what I'm doing is that I'm using a qualitative method of some structure uh, interviews with stakeholders such as campus I am a CEO, external consultant, um, academic expert, course developer, etc. Et and the main thing that I try to, to do is to answer the question how the spread of MOOCs affected the relationship between higher education institution and open education resource uh, provider. During the interview, I took into account, of course, the effect of COVID-19 on online learning and lifelong learning. It has a, a lot of uh, effect. And I have to say one ethical disclaimer that I don't work at Campus I have, uh, but I have many uh, interfaces uh, with them because I do research about the data, I um, uh, produce a course for them and other stuff. So I have some interaction with them. Uh, some initial findings from the interviews that I have done and that I'm analyzing now. So uh, what you can see from the interview is uh, that the bazaar didn't replace the cathedral. And this is one important thing. So the replacement narrative that grew uh, before uh, was not correct as we predicted. Uh, the university is, as you may know, hasn't been closed. And after the lockdown due to the COVID-19, the student came back uh, to the campus. But at the same time, the academic ecosystem evolved and become richer. A new ecosystem was created into which Campus AL was uh, integrated and uh, several academic institutions <laughs> with education and technology centers with the expertise creating MOOCs with uh, Campus AL. New forms of uh, academic courses have been created, for example, short academic courses, MOOCs accompanied and academic courses, academic courses for general public, and MOOCs to do best preparation for university entrance like SHGs and, and similar results. So, uh, to conclude my um, very uh, beginning of the description, we see an evaluation and not revolution. So, uh, as it has been in the, in the software sector, the open education source uh, software didn't replace companies like Microsoft and IBM. We can see that also MOOCs, open educational resources, didn't replace the universities, but had a mutual interaction between the two, uh, between the two uh, sectors. Uh, that's it. Thank you. With the rules of saying that, she was ask a few questions, please. Okay. So, um, Charles Severance, the last slide I had. So he is a professor at University of Michigan, but he, he you know, he, he has, does things, all sorts of things online with, with, with MOOCs. Yeah. Um, I mean, Coursera, and, you know, all this, so he puts all of his stuff out there. And it, that's, that, that seems to, I mean, I'm, you know, I, it wouldn't dissuade me from wanting to sign up and be in his classroom and be able to talk to him and hang out with him, you know, and all of that. So. It, it's interesting, but it also kind of leads toward a flipped classroom. I, I, I've noticed, like, the fact that I have MOOCs available means I can ask students to watch the lecture at home, and then we can come into class and do stuff together. So, uh, for sure, I, I'm the, I'm one of the courses that I'm teaching is about how to develop uh, MOOCs. So my students are instructor and designers that are, at the end of the course, creating MOOCs. And one part of the course is that I'm sending them to a course at Campus AM. It's called, it is named MOOC on MOOC, MOOC about MOOC. So in this MOOC, they are learning how to create MOOC. So I'm using that, I'm coming from the cathedral, from the university, but I'm using those open source all the time. That's I think, the mutual things and the enrichment is more created into the, into the cathedral instead of just replacing, replacing that. Uh, my name is Erika. I'm from a vocational school in the Netherlands and we're just exploring the possibilities of open learning. Um, I think she's the open 
Um, and how uh, I was interested by your uh, interest for a business model, yeah. Because when we talk about open learning, it's assumed to be all free. And how is your university finance? Is it is the MOOC new students or learners need to pay for attending the MOOCs? So, when I so it's, it's a great question, I have to say two things about it. But when we are talking about business model, it's not a monetary model, so it's not how we are financing. That, but rather how we are looking, how we analyze the uh, universities. Um, that's what the one from the campus AL is a governmental uh, service. Mm -hmm. So the government is uh, a, a monetizing to pay for, we won't get into the how yeah. it, but he's paid to the universities in order to develop the courses. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, the courses have become free uh, to the public. Mm -hmm. So the government, the, the finance is from the government, it's public money, the university get it, uh, develop the course, and then open it. We have some universities now that if you are, uh, if you'd like to come to the university mm -hmm. and using the SAT uh, exam, you're familiar with that, right? It's kind of exam that you are doing in order to get into the university. Mm -hmm. the government. So today you can take two MOOCs, uh, pass them, and if you pass them, you don't have, you don't need to have an SAT for example. So we have this kind of a model as well. So there are different uh, monetized models of how to make money out of them, but the university doesn't, don't pay for you to use the MOOC. The MOOCs are open to the public. Because, so your government, so your government is paying for your government to use kind of your courses. Yeah. Uh, in the Netherlands, um, the students are, we, we as a school are paid for the amount of students that come to us. It's a different. You are paid for the government? We, uh, uh, we inform the government every uh, twice a year how much students are attending yeah. our uh, courses. Mm -hmm. And the government is paying us based on the amount of students, not based on the amount of Courses we are offering. Yeah. So it's a different kind of. I, I, I separate it between the university. My university works the same. So students are paying some attention uh, mm -hmm. fees and the government gives some. some mm -hmm. That's what the university But I want to talk about the open courses. About the books. Yeah. The books are separate. They are sitting on different platforms, not related to my or other university. <coughs> uh, <coughs> the government, let's say. And that's why it's for free. Yeah, so I separate it between the university and how they are making money mm -hmm. from pension fees and, and from the government. And most uh, campus entities is open to the public as well, in general. They have other mechanisms where they make money, but we won't get it because it's a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm quite interested in the uh, business models side of things. And I'll actually be speaking the very same spot as you in 24 hours' time uh, in this room about some of the work we do in the non-core project. Um, when you look into the kind of um, the literature around business levels, it's almost always framed from this kind of com competition perspective. So uh, you kind of, you know, which kind of makes sense because the whole history of looking at business models is for business and they want to, you know, they're working in a kind of competitive environment. But do you find that this is a sort of a problem sometimes when we're talking about open education, which is a more collaborative paradigm a lot of the time? And just how, how did you deal with that when you're kind of conceptualizing this stuff? I use it as a comparison tool, not as a competition tool. So I'm less interested about, or I said, I said, so I use the, the, this model in order to compare it between, uh, uh, between different uh, uh, players of the field. Um, and so it's less important for me the competition by itself. It's, <coughs> but I think that when, 10 years ago, when we spoke about the replacement narrative, it's, the main idea was about the competition. Okay, we have universities that they are going to compete with the uh, MOOCs, OERs, etc. And what we found then, and I think that now that we have the historical perspective, we can see that the 
wasn't the competition, but collaboration. And I think that in this collaboration, everyone is winning, right? In, uh, in this place, you are thinking about how to make more and more collaboration. So I'm using the tool for that. This is more as a, a comparison tool, analytical tool. That's about the competition between the, the players in the different. Uh, <laughs> Hi, oh, yes, very interesting. I mean, I know uh, I you've up, right? <laughs> some of it as well. Just link to what Rob just said. And he recently um, did a session uh, on his project and the business model and, and, and business models. And afterwards, I started thinking about that, about the competition, etc. I'm wondering, are these business models really the most suitable ones to evaluate open education? And my inquiry took me to evaluating social innovation, perhaps. Is there maybe a different angle of, of looking at that? And what do you think about what things what what said about the Olson? How are you connected how are you connected to social innovation? Yeah, instead of using business models, which are that competitive drive and making money, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, for us it's more about adding value in terms of social value and making change happen, etc. So is there an opportunity maybe or a need to defocus from that business sort of pathway towards a more looking at it from a social innovation side. So I, I think that the, the idea of this model is that there are different frameworks for that, but to look for free uh, competence that every institution has. So every institution has a, a customer, <laughs> and you have to think what, a, what is the value proposition you are offering to your customer. He has some uh, infrastructure, the university has very uh, certain like this uh, lecture hall and uh, cafeterias and all of that, and uh, some financial. And I think that in almost every uh, organization or institution that you prepare, we have to bring um, uh, uh, components. Um, there are other models that use different components, but maybe more suitable to the situation, but it's, not, it's my expertise is more suitable. I'm not sure that I am an expert in that in classes. So, so if I got this right, there was a question of whether the, the bazaar is replacing the cathedral. The answer is no. In the best of cases, it's complementary. Yeah. But, but now more on the educational level, aren't there also like severe conflicts, uh, like in terms of how to design a program, courses? Wouldn't you have to, you know, take some decisions in terms of creating a face-to-face -face community or an online community? Do you see like fault lines in this cathedral and bazaar, uh, uh, you know, contrast in the future? Let's say, oh, there are some, you know, open conflicts that need to be addressed with how these two models are actually not just complementary. But actually, really, you know, pose a pose a problem. Uh, it's a good question. I think that if I'm quick thinking about the question because uh, it's, uh, it's been a bit thinking. But I think that what we will see in the future, and I think the open uh, session today was also related to that, is that many different kinds of educational institutions can can live together and. Usually, what we are thinking about when we talk about educational institution, and for example, we are thinking already, and I think someone spoke about it about time. Okay, so we, we think about bachelor degrees, three years, master degree, two years, PhD, five years. But people are living now up to the age of 18, 19, whatever, they need to become like from there. So we can imagine that in 10 years, people at the age of 50 or 60. We came back to universities or educational institutions, whatever, because they would need to learn again. And soon their life will have to be lifelong learning, what we are calling. So, in order to uh, give education to a very different segment of people in the population, in the population, we have more population today, more people, they live longer, they are working longer, they are. Some place in the world has a better prosperity, so there's more time to learn. You know that? So we need many different kinds of institutions. And I think this, <coughs> this continuum between the Tibra and Brazil will just keep on uh, playing. And we should allow 
all of them to exist. This is the method. The, the method that, that we, we started with this paper with the idea that the replacement was better. And it's the same in the open, because when you look at the, for example, the software uh, uh, sector, so Python didn't replace other and sometimes Apple bought uh, Python and some other open source and not as an example, some other open source Apple that is very close garden, right? Uh, bought some open source software. So there is also all the time uh, mutual uh, uh, dependency between them. Some of them get more innovation, some of them get more uh, 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 traditional thing. It's good to have this different model. You cannot claim only one model. It doesn't make sense to play. Thanks for one more question. Yeah. I'm going to ask something that may sound a bit uh, daring. Uh, I haven't read it anywhere, so forgive me if I haven't read enough. But, you know, when I think about university, I, I remember somebody telling me was that universities are called universities because they aim to be a universe of knowledge. So they tend to, they want you to cover <laughs> human knowledge, yeah? So a university, a university is that's of knowledge yeah, in Latin. Now, um, when I look at MOOCs, uh, when I look at the way in which decisions are being made and what MOOCs are et cetera, et cetera, I got the impression that there are some bits of knowledge in a universe of knowledge and some type of approaches to learning that can be MOOCified, <laughs> yeah, if you want to use that word, and some others that are not. Yeah, so you see that there, there is a proliferation on all sorts of courses, but in the drive to create MOOCs, some knowledge and some approaches to learning are being left behind. There are things that nobody wants to invest in a MOOC for because they don't really, students don't learn that way or probably shouldn't be learning that way, or because it's not something that is glamorous enough to make it to a MOOC. So how do you think um, this idea that I'm proposing here now it's playing in that relationship between what is learned in a traditional higher university institution and what is learned in the Umbundo University, which is another concept. I don't know if you have been um, engaging with the concept of the Umbundo University. That is, you know, the proliferation of the MOOCs is kind of having a lot, leaving a lot of gaps of knowledge for students to learn somewhere else. So I can, I, I'm not sure, I don't think that books are the uh, best practice way to learn. That's for sure. Yeah, very impressive, um, yeah. sort of uh, dropout, but many things. I think that my uh, thesis, what I, I, I think is how uh, people, um, how to help people to uh, set their intentions, what they like to learn, and then how to use the book in order to fulfill these intentions. And uh, MOOCs is only one way to learn. Also, it's very passive, very uh, traditional knowledge. It's not up to date for the many times. So I think that we, again, as I said before, I think that we need many models of learning. The people have to choose, and this is maybe a better education, if it's going to be fine, uh, that one of our mission is help people to learn how to learn, right? So if we, we can help maybe this is the university, right? The journey of how to learn what you would like to learn. So if we are able to help people to learn to learn what to learn or how to learn, then we fulfill our mission and then they can use MOOCs, they can use books, they can program, they can put open source, closed source, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think that the mission of the university is to help students, people to learn. Yeah. In this sense. So that in, in some disciplines you have this possibility of kind of uh, bringing together in an I IKEA style different bits of knowledge in humanities and arts and even in social sciences there are things that you can choose the order that you learn in, them in and etc but in some of the disciplines the order in which you learn things is very much dictated by the understanding of the discipline so this is uh, something that I I find that the MOOCs um, you know People doing MOOCs need to reflect upon it, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just give us a couple of minutes just to say all just thank you.
and they don't do it on a large scale right now. So the assignment is let's see what we can do with OER. Not at the, not even as the university, at all but as the university libraries. This is not an assignment coming from all the way to the top, but from the university libraries. Sort of, yeah. Action starting from the middle of the, the, of the structure of the university. So, yeah, our two people team thought about what could we do, uh, what is normally done with OER uh, initially with uh, the university. Um, so, we figured out there are typical approaches uh, like starting with a policy. This is uh, done uh, in Germany a lot, just first writing a policy. Uh, for starting with an, an online platform like an information resource um, or starting workshops just to get people to know what is going on, what can you do with this, or starting with other services like helping building courses, building materials, and so on. So, this is a, these are all kind of top down approaches like uh, with this arrow. Um, but this arrow points to an interesting place because. What's here at the down side of top down? Um, and we don't know. As simple as that. We don't know. We don't know what our teaching staff wants, needs, thinks about open educational resources. They know this at all. So we found these approaches not suitable because we didn't want to be the hundred university in Germany that tries to start with OER and then totally miss. The, the, the target group for that. So we figured out yeah, the teaching staff is a major stakeholder when it comes to OER because they are in the end the target group. They need, will have to uh, build resources, they will have to find a way to publish them, incorporate them into their teaching. We will, in, we, we don't have like, um, a support structure at the university that helps you build the courses but system. So they will need to be with them again. Uh, yeah, they are the designers and creators, not only of the material, but also of the methodology, um, which I think is the part of art uh, in OER. Creating is one thing, but yeah, implementing it into the teaching is another thing. Um, yeah, they are key to the uh, university by dissemination. We don't get enough people on the teaching staff to use or we ought to talk about it with their colleagues, uh, etc. There is no dissemination, and then we don't have a strong argument to follow through with because the university could just say, uh, we, we don't, uh, yeah, we, we, we just leave all you are aside. So, uh, first, they would have to adapt it and then adopt it, and then we could uh, think about uh, other measures at the university level. So, if we look at German universities at, at all, and this is uh, really um, simplified because of the time now, um, as I said, a lot of third party funded projects with an expiration date. And then the status as is, so um, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of fuss going on, but then the project ends and it ends. Um, uh, there's a lot of talk throughout social media, a lot of conferences like, like this, where, we, where everyone is really um, excited about the topic, of course, and there's a lot of theoretical uh, commitment by universities by putting OER into their education statements and their policies or their yeah, papers about the future of learning, <laughs> but as I said, not real action. So when you are part of the teaching staff, it's nice that the university commits to OER, but this can be the end, right? So um, yeah, this, this is like the, the state of OER, uh, German universities, there are a few, uh, universities that are beyond that stage. Um, interesting, it's, uh, these are all in Western Germany. I don't know how that came, but uh, the Western part or the former Western part of Germany is way ahead of the Yeah, a 
but not so much everyday use by teaching staff. Um, this is something that we can see throughout all the universities. I guess it goes beyond Germany. Um, so this makes us think, why is that? So we came up with this need, needs based approach, right? To, to go to the teaching staff first. Not talking about policies, about big words, but talking to the teachers, to the professors, about what they think OER is, what they need, if they need it at all, if they find it useful. And this is what we did. Um, this is like a like a recipe for success. And I didn't really want to put it in like this steps, but that's, uh, it shows you just what we are doing. There's a lot of stuff going on between these steps, a lot of talks, a lot of uh, catching up with people we talked already uh, with uh, and stuff like that. So the first is the consultations with the teaching staff. And this is uh, the part where we are now, um, talking with everybody. We invite every single faculty uh, for talks to talks about home education research. So everyone at the university has a chance to get in touch with us, to ask questions, to just say what they want to say about home education resources. Um, and we have the chance to see the people uh, that are uh, teaching at the university. Um, we are at this stage just, it's not a workshop. We don't want to uh, endlessly go on about um, what OER is, how great it is, uh, and such. We are giving materials to them beforehand so we can uh, read about that. But we really want to start a conversation. We really want to listen to what they have to say. and. Uh, yeah, it's like a, really like, like a fireside chat with a lot of people. Um, after that, we will evaluate the talks, uh, qualitative and quantitative. Um, we will cluster what's, what came up in the talks. Uh, we will especially have an emphasis, uh, we are emphasizing the um, surprises. Because we all have like uh, this assumptions about what teaching staff is thinking about OER, um, but we want to really filter out what surprised us. Um, and then we will take this as a basic to <coughs> basis to create initial OER library service. <coughs> so that the topic comes comes up uh, a lot of times, and this will be maybe a university library service that will be there first. Um, so um, then we will develop these services, of course, and then we will reevaluate after a certain testing period. We will go get back in touch with the teaching staff. We will ask them about uh, the services, and then we, we will um, see if uh, we should uh, change anything about this. The benefits for us. Uh, are uh, there's direct input from potential users, um, and a lot of time it's really the same that we were saying um, concerning the teaching step. So it is really interesting for us to really talk uh, with them um, and minimizing the guesswork. What do we think they need? This is not a, a good approach for us. Um, we will establish new and refresh existing contexts. It's really, really important. Uh, this goes beyond OER, of course. Um, we will um, get to know people that today already uh, create and share <laughs> resources. This is uh, that we really don't right now. Um, of course, for the department I work at and the library uh, as a whole, there's uh, we gain visibility. Um, and we already and we didn't have much talks uh, at this point, but we already see that the uh, teaching staff is really does really appreciate the inclusion. That really, oh, someone comes to us and asks us what we think. Uh, we really didn't think about this being a special thing, but apparently it is because they were really glad that someone came and asked them. And they are the people. Yeah, this, these are the main benefits for us. 
Um, early findings uh, show that most discussed topic is legal matters. These are the questions that come up the most. Um, what if, but what uh, in the case, and is this and is that? It's all concerning legal matters. Um, so this will be, of course, an initial service that we team up with the legal department of the university, and we will emphasize on legal matters regarding open digital resources. Um, there are worries about the misuse of the materials. What if someone takes the material and defaces it or does something that I don't like and then it's out there? Um, confusion about where I publish or making services. Of course, we don't have a repository or anything like this. Um, so they don't really know yet what they need and what they created it. But this is a common question, of course. Um, but also a strong interest to engage with OER in the future. So they were not like turned down from 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 this. Um, but they really want to see where this is going and they want to keep up with the topic. And two surprises, um, no mention of fear of judgment. This is a heavy thing for Germans. Um, there's you know, I think you know the saying with the toothbrush, so you will share your toothbrush before you share your uh, if you make the rest what you say in Germany. Um, this, is really, this is really important because you don't want to be judged. Or maybe what if someone finds an error in my teaching materials? This would be horrible for Germany. Um, there is this counter argument. So you should be having like good materials for your students also, not just because you publish it in the world, but for your different students. Um, so if you don't, if you don't have anxiety about showing your materials to the students, you shouldn't have anxiety showing it to everyone. Um, and there was no mention of tech, which is also one of the things we talk about in, in the OER, OER community. We talk about a lot of resources. They don't have time to do this on top. Um, just to give you a perspective, um, in Germany, teaching. It's not that important in universities. Universities are basically free. Um, students concerning teaching, they will take what they can get. They won't revolve because they they had a bad lecture. This doesn't, this doesn't happen. So um, as teaching staff, and these are mostly uh, postdocs I'm talking about, um, you have other things to do than work on your teaching. Most of them, and this is uh, not neglect, this is just, uh, yeah, planning with your uh, limited resources. Most of them teach, like, from a gut feeling, from what they have, like, they have been taught. You don't have to prove teaching-wise anything to anyone at the university. So, coming with open educational resources, uh, it's not like, yeah, you get cheered uh, with enough because you bring another thing. Um, Textbooks are basically free. They are uh, most is, uh, are free ebooks or open access materials. So you don't have this incentive either that we could sh like um, yeah like um, make it easier for students uh, money wise. So the strong argument <laughs> of flat and so there have to be other arguments and. Surprisingly, they didn't mention it. They didn't say, no, I don't, don't I can't do this because I don't have time. So this was a surprise for us. And it shows us that it is the right way to just talk to them really about the topic and not just assuming what is potentially talked about concerning what we are. Um, so, yes. Um, we will have these talks with uh, all the uh, faculties uh, throughout the year, maybe next year, we don't have uh, an agenda set in stone or a deadline, really, because it's something we do on the side, it's not our main work. Um, but we will, in the end, have a lot focus of, yeah, information about the topic, all coming from the target group. And then throughout 2024, I think at the end of 2024, we will have the first. OER related 
um, services up and running. And then we will see how that goes. So, yes. Um, this was uh, basically uh, what I wanted to tell you. These are my contact information. And um, yeah, you can, of course, ask questions. I would really like to know the situation in your university or it differs from uh, other universities. What do you think about the approach? If you find something similar, um, yeah, this would really be nice. Thank you very much. Minutes left, so if you want to get some questions. So, I, I'm this is my first foray back in the OER community, and I noticed there were a lot of librarians around. And, and then that didn't surprise me when I started to reflect on it because it seems like I, I come from the computer science area, and there's really just a cornucopia of resources. I mean, it's not like lack of resources, but what we need is curation of those. It seems like a natural thing for library science. And so that's 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 one comment. But the other the question I have too is what about students? Because they're going to be coming into the library, like you George said, maybe not getting the best lecture and they need other resources. And if the library could say here's a bunch we you said all the resources are free in Germany. So that and not yeah a lot of them are. So yeah that's because that's not the case in the US at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, students is a whole other topic. Um, I don't think we will ever have the personal resources to, uh, to ask the students. Um, but I think we will work that way that we talk with the teaching staff about this because they are the direct uh, contact with the students uh, in our system. So we will just see if the teaching staff tries something, how does it work out, whether it's fun to the students. But this is what we can do. Uh, I don't think we can. We can you could do this again with students um, because it's also in Germany. Yeah. Like, um, we have legal problems concerning asking students anything. We, we don't really uh, can know much about the students uh, from a legal perspective. So we don't have a lot of data of usage, etc. So I mean, when they come into the library and say, "I need this," "I need that." Uh, they mostly come in on for the website. Oh, okay. It's just oh, oh, get the right, email. Right. There's <laughs> they are, are at the library still, but it's not how it's used. Um, I'm Emma Thomas, I work in the Netherlands in a library. So thank you very much for your presentation. I have a question about the process. Um, you, the first uh, step you said was a uh, consultation with teaching staff. I wondered who did this uh, consultation. Uh, we work with information uh, specialists. It's a question I, I ask the information specialist to talk with the people from the different uh, faculties. Uh, who uh, are the consultations? Who did it uh, in your life? Um, this is uh, my colleague and myself. So two persons. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you have open education in your um, in your job. Yes. 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 Okay. We are assigned on this topic, among several other. We consulted with uh, an expert on um, on uh, on these uh, kind of. Um, Structural talks, um, and we talked uh, with every faculty has uh, like somewhere a person that has all the email addresses. Let's put it like this. So we try to find those people uh, to talk about how in your faculty should we approach these talks. This is what we do, but. Um, the content of the of the of the consultations uh, is was asked to. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. I just know that there'll be lunch and, and, no, the no, and the noise will start outside. That's the only reason. And then bells will start on some college yeah. and, and we can also continue the chat and Discord as well online. But yeah, just thank you for the question. I don't know who was next. Um, I really don't know. Um, I think it was somebody at the back there, one of the two there, apologies. Stanislaus from Kenya, librarian, thanks for that. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask the same question to the gentleman who asked about the students. 
And I think we can work together on that because um, from my background, we have the luxury of uh, including students in the in the, in the, in the, in the, the analysis and getting their needs. But uh, I wanted to know, do you have a background within your locality or environment for open uh, education, open programs? Because it's very easy to find themselves or to find it when you bring in uh, or they are in those kind of contexts. Um, because I'm working still on the same again the background back from home. So do you have those kind of environments of open something so that these can fit in? Um, not really uh, identified as such because um, the, the, the support structure for students at, at my <laughs> university, at uh, German universities, is really fragmented. So um, a lot of, of these services are uh, like commonplace. It's, it's not especially labeled as we are doing something for you here, or this is like in the place or for talk about openness, or like we, like I just heard in the talk uh, before, these whole support structure for poor students, stuff like that. We have this, but it's not like an integrated thing. <laughs> so we can really tap into this because this is all like yeah, classified information for us. We don't we don't get to know anything about the students really, and if we try to tap into it, the students that will involved because of their personal rights. So. There is no analysis really on that. So this is like a really uh, yeah, simple <laughs> method. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sorry, it was last time we were there. Um, we couldn't quite see the market side requirements. If you don't see it, please ask one of the patrons after that.